Welcome back to Unirunner Video Drum Lessons for January 24th, 2007. My name is Darren Mathis. Glad you could tune in once again. And today I'm going to take some time with three different questions uh, and it might take some time to work through. So as you're listening to my responses, if you have things to add or comments, you can visit unirunner.com. Go to the listing for this podcast and click on comments. You can leave a comment there. Also, new to the site is the Mobitalk feature. If you want to check that out, you can leave audio comments. All you have to do is have a, a microphone hooked up to your computer. Click leave a message and you can say something in there and play it back. If you don't like it, just hit record over it and it'll record right over it until you get it the way you want it. And if you don't discover you don't want to leave a message after all just hit cancel you don't have to send it but it's kind of neat to mess around with if you go to unirunner.com it's over on the left side of the page down a little bit so check that out like I said I've got three different emails so I'll try and get through these uh, pretty quick but uh, each one could go into a lot of detail so like I said if you have things to add feel free to do that at unirunner.com uh, this one's from Nick it says hey how are you doing I live in California I've been drumming for about 15 years now Never had a lesson, been wanting to start some. I'm a little nervous that I might, uh, I might have a lot of bad habits to overcome through by learning myself. Is that a legitimate fear or should I just do it? I know with the right teacher I could explode into a more technical drummer. I have to say that I'm not bad now. I just know if I could be better, if, for instance, if I could read music and knew what to practice when I sit in front of my kit. I recently started watching your video podcasts and been enjoying them because you don't seem arrogant or anything. As a matter of fact, I really enjoy, or rather enjoy your style. Uh, it's only, only time I get a little caught off guard is when you start to use the one e and a two e and a talk. Uh, that's when I get lost sometimes because I don't read music. And he goes on, uh, talks about playing with his iPod anyway. Um, so the basis of the question there that I want to focus is on is when he gets to the point where he says uh, he was wondering if he should take drum lessons, if he should be afraid because he might have developed bad habits over the years or not. Well, uh, I think when you think about taking drum lessons from someone, uh, that is a legitimate fear because most of the time if you go to a drum instructor, they're not going to be really concerned with what you might have learned. Like for instance, when I first started taking lessons, all I had, I had a few lessons from a music teacher at school, but she had special, hasn't specialized in drums, so she probably wasn't as good as with the drums as she was with her specialty instrument, whatever that was, clarinet or something. So when I went to a specific drum teacher for one of the first times, he kind of, it was kind of like that scene from a Karate Kid with Mr. Miyagi where he pretty much tells Daniel that he's going to have to throw out everything he knows, listen to him, and, you know, ask no questions, that type of thing. So when I went in and I thought I knew how to play a drum roll, which really wasn't, it was some sort of a cross between a buzz roll and a rudimental roll, I really had to throw that out because I was really confused when he started telling me, you know, to do two separate distinct strokes on each hand. It really wasn't, didn't, didn't seem like a roll to me, so I was kind of confused, you know, should I listen to what he's saying, should I trust him, or should I uh, trust my former teacher? So uh, there's that element of trust you have to establish with, a te with any teacher, I think. But so when you go to, your, go to take lessons, you can take that uh, approach that as long as you're willing to give up what you have learned, or at least to listen to what they say, uh, practice it, and don't, you know, if you start bringing up conversation like well that's fine but this is how I do it that usually doesn't work too well because uh, the teacher knows usually how to teach in one way uh, and that has to do with the, the student listening to what he or she says and then taking that and practicing it so it can be a way to broaden your style even if you don't adopt everything your teacher says it's good to get another um, reference point or another perspective on a different style uh, and you don't have to scrap everything you're doing, but generally when you're practicing what this teacher has taught you, you will have to scrap uh, everything you've learned before if it doesn't match up with that particular teacher's style. So I wouldn't be afraid of, of taking lessons as long as you're willing to be humble enough to just listen and soak up what this teacher has to say. And like I've said before, you might want to try a couple different teachers. Uh, you know, if you have more than one teacher in town, maybe sign up to take a lesson. Just let them know you're trying to uh, establish, you know, take lessons or you're trying to 
what your goals are basically. Explain to him or her what your goals are. So I hope that answers part of your questions and with the one and a two and a talk, uh, you do get a little bit of basis, you know, if you go take lessons and things like that and reading music that can be helpful to help you grow. Uh, some people don't really ever need to take lessons because they're so ambitious they're able to find everything they need on their own. And you might call that taking lessons too, even if you just buy instructional videos or you research things on the internet or maybe you just watch other drummers. Uh, it's just a diff different way to take it, look at taking lessons. Not necessarily one-on-one -on -one with a person you're paying, but you might be taking lessons You know, every time you open up Modern Drummer Magazine or every time you pop in a DVD. I think a lot of my learning took place after I got done with formal lessons because when I was in formal lessons I kind of felt this pressure uh, to practice which was good, it made me learn, but it also took a little bit of the joy out of it. So being kind of a rebel that I am every once in a while, just the fact that I had to do something made me not want to do something. So once I was done taking lessons and I was kind of free, uh, I just felt a little less pressure and, and learning became even more of a joy. So uh, just a couple of things to keep in mind. So if you have comments about that or things to add, feel free to go to unirunner.com. Let me move on to my next email here. It's from Samuel, and Samuel says, Hi, my name's Samuel. I've been dr playing drums for two years. I'm getting ready to play the drums for our church. We have a small church of less than 200 people who are mostly older. I will be playing contemporary music with only a piano. I was wondering if you have any tips on style, sound control, etc. I really enjoy your podcast. Keep them coming. Thanks, Samuel. Thanks, Samuel, for your email. Uh, tips on style, playing with the piano. That's a good question. I, I did that in high school a few times for musicals where it was just drums and piano. And one thing to keep in mind is the balance between the sounds, especially if your piano player, if the piano they're using is not mic'd or amplified in any way, if it's not hooked through a PA, uh, you really have to keep a balance. And you can do that by using hot rods like this, or these are, these are lightning rods. These are a little bit thicker. Then these hot rods are made up of dowels that are a little bit thinner. Or you can use brushes, and those help create a balance between the piano and the uh, drums. And it's really about complementing the piano. And a lot of times, I don't know what the phenomenon is or why this is necessarily, if a lot of piano students don't practice with metronomes, but it seems like pianos a lot of times, or the piano players a lot of times, don't have or haven't practiced with a metronome a lot if they haven't played with a band, you might have to adjust your tempo to whatever the piano player is doing. I've had that happen in the past where often piano players are so get so in tune with just practicing with themselves, not like a guitarist. It seems like more people that pick up the guitar or drums do it because they want to play with other people in a band. Not that uh, piano players are uh, loners or anything like that, but uh, you know, piano, lots of times it's kind of a solitary thing where you spend a lot of time practicing by yourself before you can get into a band. I think if you play guitar, uh, you know, you may only need to know about two or three chords to get into a band from there. But I think because a lot of times the piano players might grow up playing only with themselves, and if they don't practice with a metronome constantly, they might develop their own sense of tempo that really fluctuates. And so, and maybe during a song, the, the, the tempo is it's called for to fluctuate too. So you have to be aware of that as a drummer playing with a piano player, that they might fluctuate tempo. And sometimes you have to take your lead from them, especially if uh, they haven't played with a drummer a lot. So I hope those tips help you. Above all else, be able to hear the piano, hopefully even better than your own playing, if you're locked in with one other instrument, because uh, I would say more than 50% of what you're going to play uh, has to do with what you're hearing. So keep that in mind. I hope that helps. My last email comes from David and he says, after years of praise drum, praise band drum man where I was relegated to a hard electronic set, I retired and moved to Mississippi and now attend a church at a PSA or PCA ministry where there is no praise band. 
the choir even sings a cappella. So I set up my electric drums and PA in the bonus room and enjoyed jamming with the grandkids. Now my first band as a drummer, the Sherwoods, is playing a reunion gig next October at the Chai Fi House at Hamden, Sydney College, and they want me to drum. So he goes on to ask, my acoustic drums are a nice old six-piece set of premieres with an eclectic mix of Z, Peisty, and Sabian cymbals. I forgot how difficult it is to get the drums to sound good with my internet and my internet research has done little more than confuse me. Could you possibly help me with a few points? One, how do you tune toms? For example, are they the same pitch or is there a guide for what note to tune what size? Uh, two, how about snare tuning for British Invasion slash pop? Three, kick drum says I'm lost. I put a muffling pad next to the batter side and I can barely hear it when playing along with the practice CD they sent me. David, thanks for your email and I'll address those questions. And again, I'm, I'll say address or respond to them. Not that these are the definitive answers, but something to start a conversation and think about. Number one, how do you tune the toms? Is there a guide for what note to tune what size? Well, actually, uh, no. <laughs> but some manufacturers, and I, I, I can't think of any other manufacturer other than Drum Workshop that does this. They stamp the note, uh, the, the note of the shell inside the the uh, the shell. So like for instance if you stripped off all the hardware and heads off the drum and just hit the shell of the drum with your hand you would hear a basic note that that shell uh, creates. So what they do is they try to figure out what note that shell creates and stamp it on the inside. And they say if you tune to that note you're going to have maximum resonance but you don't necessarily have to. As far as what I do for tuning, you can check back a later or an earlier podcast on tuning if you just go to unirunner.com and, and type in tuning, you should be able to find it. But uh, what I do mainly is by feel. And there's no set, in my opinion, no set increment or note that any tom should be tuned to. With my toms, lots of times I just try and sound, find what sounds the best for each tom. And generally, if the toms smaller than another one, I'm going to want that smaller tom to sound higher. Uh, and the increment between the, the two rack toms might be shorter than the increment between the bottom two. But at least with these toms and a lot of toms, the sensitivity of the tension rods is so great that even a small turn can take your drum from sounding really nice and resonating to just choking it and getting all these weird overtones. So the key, like I pointed out in an earlier tuning podcast for me, is to tune very small increments. I start go by going around the drum head and just getting the tension rods to sit on top of the rims. And then I do it finger tight, not even finger tight, just half finger tight. I go, I go around really uh, quickly, but in tiny little increments on the tension rods. And that's what a lot of these products that measure tension on your head, what they help you to do is to create an even head tension which is really helpful because once you get one tension rod out of whack or tighter than the others, um, then all of a sudden the head isn't able to resonate as freely. So that's my response to that one. Next, how about snare tuning for British Invasion slash uh, rock slash pop? Well, in, when in doubt, at least for me with the snare drum, what I like to do is crank it up uh, really tight. Uh, mine's kind of a medium tightness now. And I use a little bit of moon gel muffling on there too. But if your snare is hard to get, at, get control over, if it has a lot of odor overtones, what you can do is put a double ply head on there. A lot of times people don't like to do that. They like to put on a white coated ambassador or another coated head on the top like this. So you can, if you want to use brushes, you can hear that. But if you're, I used to use a snare drum that just had a pinstripe double ply on there. And I really like the sound of that. Uh, but now I'm into more of a ringier sound. I like to hear the overtones and the resonance as much as possible. Especially if you're playing with a band, you might start out with a muted drum that sounds pretty good at home or has a lot of padding on it. But then when you go to play with a band, you can't hear the drum really. So that's happened to me recently when I went and jammed with some guys. I had my moon gel on the drum and everything. Once I started playing with them, I realized their instruments were at least as loud if not louder than my drum so I took off all the moon gel the drum sounded really good just totally wide open which happens a lot of times that doesn't they don't sound necessarily as as good sometimes depending on what room you're in or if you're just by yourself and all you're hearing is the drums and not other instruments mixed in competing for the same frequencies 
So, but as far as pop, a pop sound with your drum, you're always pretty safe and tightening up pretty high, putting some muffling on there. Inexpensive muffling might include cutting up another drum head into a ring and putting that on there or taking a bit of duct tape, making a little flap that sticks up or even putting some paper towels or toilet paper under the duct tape. That's an inexpensive muffling too because then you get a real quick poppy sound to it. Last question, kick drum says I'm lost. I put a muffling pad next to the batter side and I can barely hear it when playing along my practice CD. Same thing with the kick drum. If you put a lot of muffling in there, it's going to shorten the, the sound of your the note. It's not going to be as boomy and you're not going to be hearing a ringy kick drum, but also it's not going to be as loud. So some things you can do that with that is obviously lessen the muffling or you can get uh, you can use a plastic beater or a harder beater will give you more of a click sound against your bass drum head or you can put one of these if you're going to do that you might want to put one of these I think they're called foam slams or something like that these little Remo sticker drum heads I had one one time I put on my head because I was going to use the plastic side of my beaters just to see you get a real click and it's kind of nice especially if you play heavy metal or other things where you want a real distinctive clicky uh, punchy bass drum sound but for me I like a little bit more of a boom in there so I like the softer sound uh, but with the kick drum too start off with the tuning super loose and just tiny increments around the drum head I usually tighten mine up so it just gets the creases out of the head and then maybe one more time around just a little bit but the bass drum heads are really loose on mine uh, so I kind of like that feel too. It's got a little bit of a squishiness. It's not really too hard when I kick it. So I don't know if I would say, actually I shouldn't say that the kick drum heads are really loose, but uh, they're pretty loose. I mean, probably pretty comparable to the tom tightness, maybe a little bit looser. Well, thanks again for tuning in and watching as I work through some of these questions. And uh, I hope you might have picked something up or might be able to contribute or add something to one of the topics I talked to through Unirunner.com. I want to thank our sponsor today who's an anonymous sponsor who supported the podcast on behalf of all the Sunday school teachers who still like to pound out good grooves on Saturday night. May God bless them, everyone. Thanks a lot. And thanks to everyone who supported the podcast and tuned in and, and uh, helped me out as far as working through some of these topics with your comments and emails. And until next time, take care, keep practicing, and God bless.